everyone. Thank you for joining us this beautiful afternoon. Um, we appreciate you joining us on this lovely spring afternoon to learn about gut health. As everyone gets settled, um, we want to, I want to give you a quick little overview of what we'll be talking about today. We, um, we have Margaret Haldeman speaking on gut health. Uh, this diverse collection of tiny creatures is known as our microbiota and bacteria has always been considered bad germs, but now we know that the vast majority of these microbes help keep us healthy. Um, as you, we go through the presentation today, please feel free to use the chat to ask any questions. Our speaker will be stopping periodically through to answer those. Um, so please take advantage of that. If you would like to disable the closed captions, click on live transcript on the bottom, it's a little icon, and then click on hide subtitles. Um, and we are recording today's presentation. So if you do know someone who is unable to make it, we will be sharing it with SCTV and adding it to the library's YouTube channel. And with that intro all set, Margaret, the floor is yours. Thank you. Great. Uh, first of all, thank you for letting me uh, speak to you today. Um, this is one of the areas that I've been working on for a number of years. Um, First of all, my, um, my background is actually biochemistry. My bachelor's degree and PhD are in biochemistry. I worked on protein degradation for a number of years and then database development. And then I um, got a job in Connecticut uh, working in the area of microbiome science. Um, uh, my PhD, my postdoc was in microbiology looking at ways um, microbes uh, acquire antibiotic resistance and so this, this, this wasn't completely a, a leap um, from a completely different area, but um, it kind of built a little bit on what, what I was already studying in some respects. But um, I just wanted to talk to you today about the gut and the microbiome in particular and, and its role in gut health, but also in other areas of health. Um, and I'm just, I have a little bit of an outline here, um, just some defining some terms so people are familiar with the terms. Um, and then uh, a few, a slide or two about the significance of the microbiome on health in general, and then um, ways to improve, uh, potentially improve your gut microbiome, and then therefore improving your gut health. And then all the ways that uh, your gut is involved in other areas of your body, if we have time. But um, as Lindsay said, please use the chat for questions and I'll try to stop um, periodically to, um, to address anything before we get too far. Sound good? So just beginning, you know, what is the microbiota? So the microbiota is defined as the microorganisms that live inside us and on us. And we, t we often use microbiota as a synonym of gut microbiota. And we also use the word microbiota as a synonym for microbiome, but they are they are different. Um, when we talk about the microbiota, so that's the organisms, it's fungi, bacteria, viruses that are inhabiting our body inside and out, um, we have a few features that we think are important. One is diversity, so that's all the different types of organisms that inhabit us, and the other is abundance, which is the amount of these organisms. And it, it, it stands to reason um, that these are two features that might play a role in the, in the health of our microbiota. Um, but what I think is really interesting and what we've learned over the last decade or so is that our human cells, um, are, we have far fewer human cells than we have microbial cells inhabiting our, our ecosystem, what's called our body and our microbiota, our ecosystem. Um, and why that's so amazing is because, and we'll address it a little bit with the microbiome, um, because the microbiome involves all the organisms that I just mentioned, and then specifically the environment and the genes that they all deliver. So that's that microbial world. Um, and the reason I point out the number of uh, different microbes that are in your body, think about all the genes that those microbes deliver to your body, all the functions that they potentially deliver to you. 
Um, and when we think about drug targets, think about that as well. You know, uh, we, are, we are all so similar from a human genome standpoint. Um, there's, there's almost very little difference between you and, any, and anyone else on this call in terms of our human genome, but our bacterial genome is very different. Um, and in fact, your bacterial genome can change throughout your life. So when we think about ways of modulating our health, uh, the microbiome is an amazing target because it's very unique and selective. And when you target a gene in your human genome, you can mess up a lot of other things at the same time. I mean, cancer treatments are a perfect example of this. Um, but if you're targeting a microbe, um, you may not have as big of a side effect, for example, or an adverse event. Um, but anyway, so the microbiota is defined as the microbiome plus all the genes and the environment that they create. And I just wanted to point out again that um, that's a lot more genes than your human cells deliver and that more of these genes are unique to you um, from the microbial uh, contribution. So we have microbiota and microbiome. And just to give you a little level setting about how amazing this um, category has become. So prior to COVID-19, I would say this was probably one of the areas that was exploding um, most amazingly, if you will, um, from an academic research standpoint and quite and a, and a company investment standpoint. So this is just a chart that kind of um, tries to take home the message about how much investment of time and resources and money are being devoted to the microbiome. Um, we have publications, the explosion of different publications on the upper left, and then various uh, charitable organizations, as well as um, businesses that have come out of microbiome research in the middle, where we have the Gates Foundation and the, the National Microbiome Initiative. And on the far right, um, just the investment uh, of uh, venture capital, for example, in um, microbiome work. Um, on the lower right, we actually have companies that have sprung out of the information that has been acquired over the last 10 years of microbiome research. Most of these are testing uh, uh, companies. They'll test your, um, your fecal microbiome, your oral microbiome or skin microbiome and try to determine where you fit um, in the general public um, as they define the general public. And then in the, in the center, lower part of the center of the slide, <laughs> sorry, um, that's the number of, of patents that have been granted. Um, another, another measurement of um, exploding information and exploding interest. And on the far uh, lower left, um, that's just a cue me to remind everyone that the tools for genetics, uh, the tools for sequencing um, both human and microbial genes have just become so much more accessible, um, so much uh, less expensive, um, so we can learn so much more about the genes that our microbiome contribute to our health. Um, and this is a slide just to remind me to tell you about all the different diseases and um, health issues that are of interest with respect to the microbiome. So what I did here was looked at the number of clinical trials registered in clinicaltrials.gov that were related to the microbiome or tools that will, um, will intervene in the microbiome. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and all the diseases that um, researchers think might play a role uh, with respect to the microbiome. So it's not just gastrointestinal uh, disorders. Um, there's a lot of data coming out about um, emotional and mental health issues, um, even uh, lung, um, like pneumonias and, and vulnerabilities to pneumonias and other, and other um, not gut related things. There's also uh, research being done on the role of the microbiome in fertility. So there's really nothing, I mean, there's, it's just from head to toe, um, the, the, the way that we believe the microbiome is uh, involved in our health. Um, so where does the microbiota come from? Where does the microbiome and the my microbiota come from? Well, we know now that the vast majority of the microorganisms that you have today came from your mother. Um, during the vaginal delivery, uh, microorganisms from the mom are, are deposited on the baby. And that's, you know, as designed, so to speak. 
Um, and what we've learned from many, many years of research, um, we've learned that cesarean delivery provides a different set of microorganisms because that not, not, um, not passing through the, the vaginal canal, um, they, those babies escape some of the microorganisms that perhaps would confer a health benefit. So cesarean delivery, children are typically colonized by uh, microorganisms that are from the mom's skin and the environment. Um, and it's not just um, moms that influence it, although they play a big, big part. Um, that initial seeding event is very important, but we also know that going forward, diet and genetics, the environment you live in, um, drugs or supplements that you may take, these all will have an impact on your microbiota um, over the course of time. We also know that age affects the microbiome. Um, as uh, a healthy microbiome for a baby is di looks different than a healthy microbiome for an adult, at least as we know it today. So I've told you about, at least I've, I've alluded to the fact that the microbiota is critical for our health. Um, and the gut microbiota is, is critical because of what it does. Um, it, those microorganisms contribute to a variety of processes in our body which confer health. So for starters, the microorganisms um, contribute to the barrier that's established in our intestines, right? So that's an area that probably sees more um, toxins and pathogens than, than almost any other part of our, our body. Um, because we're, we're getting those, um, those compounds and microbes from the food we eat and even what we breathe. So on top of what the lungs see, the gut microbiota sees even more. Um, and so this barrier is very important because it keeps pathogens, it keeps disease-causing microbes out, it uh, keeps um, harmful compounds out, and it lets the things we want to let in, in. Um, so... Uh, Important nutrients um, are, are allowed through the gate, where, whereas compounds that could cause a problem are excluded from the gate. Um, the gut microbiota also contributes to digestive function. So there are a number of compounds that our bodies actually don't digest. It's the microbes in our gut that digest them. And so those microbes are able to harvest nutrients that would otherwise um, be ex excreted. Um, we also know that the gut microbiota is involved with the immune system. Um, it has a co it contributes to inflammation. Um, it contributes to uh, a balanced and healthy immune response. Um, and it, it, it's even um, known to uh, stimulate antibiotic, antibody production um, in response to vaccines, for example. Um, and the microbiota itself, the organisms in our microbiota, actually produce nutrients that we need, that we can't get any, get any other way. Um, they, there are some organisms that produce vitamins that we need, enzymes that we need. Um, they produce mucus, which is another um, layer of protection um, in our gut barrier. And they also produce short chain fatty acids. And short chain fatty acids are the key nutrient for the cells in our intestines. So uh, to have healthy intestinal lining, you need short chain fatty acids. And for short chain fatty acids, you need a healthy microbiota. Um, and because the gut microbiota influences the barrier protection and all the nutrient um, use, use, not only use, but production, um, it's also highly involved in nutrient absorption. So when um, the microbiota is thrown off kilter, uh, certain vitamins and minerals and other fuels for our body um, are not properly absorbed. Um, and I alluded to a little bit of this. So we know that the microbiome changes throughout the lifespan. Um, a baby um, typically is, uh, is colonized with a certain type of um, genus of organisms known as bifidobacteria. Um, but as, as we age, that population of bifidobacteria typically declines. Um, and, and one relationship we see with a changing microbiota is a changing immune system. So in this picture, as, uh, as an individual progresses from um, baby to older adult, um, we typically see a, a decrease in diversity of the microbiota, 
a decrease in good bacteria. So some of the um, key players that we know are fundamental for our health, they decline. Um, and an increase in the pathogens or the disease causing bacteria uh, and an increase in uh, in inflammation. Um, and so in, re in and related to that, we also see a decline in, uh, in immune function. So um, there's a term called immunosenescence that uh, describes the aging of an immune system, for example. And immunosenescence is believed to contribute to a rise in inflammation, which, uh, which we now know is you know, a fundamental element of many, many diseases. So and these are all interrelated, the microbiome, the immune system, inflammation. Um, so looking at the microbiome as at least one factor that maybe we can improve, may improve our immune responses and um, also in, improve our inflammatory state. Um, again, um, because of what the microbiome can do, um, there are things that influence the microbiome and, the, and its ability to do those functions, its ability to protect the integrity of the gut barrier and help with digestion and stimulate the immune system. We know that diet plays a key role, um, where you live plays a key role, whether you have pets, whether you spend time outdoors, these are all elements that we believe um, influence the microbiome. Uh, the supplements or medications that you take, and as I mentioned, age. Um, maybe we, we can see if there's any questions. Hey, Margaret. Um, as of right now, we don't have any just yet. Fair. Fair. I just didn't want to get too far. I tend to talk too fast, so you'll have to put the brakes on for me. <laughs> Not at all. Thanks. Um, and again, you know, just to just to show you about microbiome health, while we think it it can play a role in so many many things, um, we we actually have evidence that it plays a role in digestive health, immunity, this you know, health of the skin, your oral health, um, and all the all these other elements here listed on the slide. Um, and another thing that I, I'm finding more and more evidence on is the uh, contribution of the microbiome to your perceived stress uh, and emotional health. We're seeing more and more evidence of that um, over time. And, and that's actually one, a big focus of um, research right now as folks are dealing with a lot of stress um, due to the pandemic. Uh, so it's a time to kind of uh, focus on an element of the pandemic, but still looking at the microbiome's role in, in, in the stress um, perception. Um, the next thing I'm going to talk about is antibiotics. So uh, for years and years and years, antibiotics had been thought of as being um, really a wonder drug. And, and I'm, not, I'm not disagreeing with that at all. But we know now that antibiotics have unintended consequences. Um, if, if someone needs an antibiotic, if they have a bacterial infection, uh, prescribing the right antibiotic for that bacterial infection is invaluable. Um, as we know, it's life-saving. However, we also know that prescribing an antibiotic when it's not a bacterial infection or potentially prescribing the wrong antibiotic can lead to problems. So antibiotics we know um, target specific pathogens, right? If you have an ear infection, your doctor is going to give you a, an antibiotic that might be different from um, an infection in your foot, you know, in the skin infection or, or a bronchitis infection, right? It, it targets a specific pathogen. But what we also know is that it targets all the bacteria in the gut or many bacteria in the gut. And so you may be killing the pathogen, but you're also going to be killing some good bacteria that you need. Um, and as a result, you may see, you know, you may have diarrhea, you may have um, even a suppressed immune system. And one of the things that we have learned is that when you lose um, good bacteria, the bad bacteria really can take off. And so an example of, of this is actually C. difficile uh, associated diarrhea. Um, that's a very common um, form of diarrhea that is at, uh, as a result of antibiotic use, typically. Um, so what happens is they, they, the antibiotics has done a great job at, at diminishing the C. difficile, 
but in the, in the process, um, other good bacteria are also lost. Um, and this actually gives the C. difficile an opportunity to rebound. And that's when uh, folks can get very, very sick. Um, and that's an extreme example, but we believe that um, some antibiotics can throw your gut microbiota off for up to a year, uh, which is a very long time to be out of balance and a very long time for your immune system to be vulnerable. So um, again, antibiotics are obviously life-saving um, treatments, but they need to be used with caution um, and appropriately uh, to preserve the gut microbiota. Um, so one of the tools that we have learned about that can influence your microbiota um, is our probiotics. And probiotics, um, the, the official definition are, is live microorganisms, which when administered in adequate amounts confer a health benefit on the host. Um, briefly put, they are, um, they are microbes that you can add to your daily regimen to, to give you a health benefit. Um, so in this case, you are the, you are the host, right? And, in, and knowing which microorganisms and how much is really the, is really the, secret, the secret sauce. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and and just, just a graphic to show you that probiotics are one of the things that can influence your microbiota. And in so doing, influence many of the functions that the microbiota is responsible for. Um, when we talk about probiotics, this will help with um, understanding uh, what is meant by a benefit and an adequate amount, etc. Um, when we talk about probiotics, we need to talk about three names uh, in, of the probiotic. Um, from, our, from our high school biology days, I think some of us can remember the terms genus and species. Um, and for probiotics, this is, a, this is the start, but it's not the end. So with a probiotic, you need to know the genus and the species, but then you also need to know the, the strain or the third name. So you're looking for three names for a probiotic. And the reason is that benefits are strain specific. Um, and an analogy that we use for this, um, we use dogs as an analogy. So you have a St. Bernard and you have a Chihuahua um, they are the same genus species, but they're clearly different, uh, different animals. Um, they have different um, exercise needs, different food needs, and they deliver different benefits to people. Um, so when you think about a probiotic, think about, you know, what is it that, um, what is it that they need and what do they deliver, right? You, you wouldn't say, you wouldn't say all drugs, take a drug right? You, you have a runny nose, just take a drug. No, you need to know what specific drug it is. Or you wouldn't say, you know, just eat food, all food is healthy, um, or all food is, you know, good for you. Um, no, you need to know the specific food. So when you think about probiotics, think about that specificity um, that the strain uh, describes. Um, and then again, when that, we think about that definition, um, it's a live microorganism when delivered in adequate amounts. Um, and the way doses of probiotics are described most accurately is by the units called colony forming units. And that describes the ability of the probiotic to be viable. Um, some labels, in fact, the FDA requires that labels are um, are described, the dose is described in milligrams, which is not an appropriate unit of measure for live microorganisms. So you, you're, you're looking for not only three names for the strain, but you're looking for uh, units of measure called colony forming units, CFUs, um, because we believe that probiotic effects are dose specific. So you need an adequate number to get the benefit. And we're, we're relying on clinical evidence for this. So if the clinical study used a specific strain at a specific dose, we have to assume that you need that dose in the absence of other information, that you need that dose to get the benefit. Um, and, I, and the third bullet alludes to that. So the dose, on the, the dose being delivered by a probiotic product should be based on studies in humans um, that have demonstrated the benefit at that dose. And then the, the last piece about this is that um, probiotics 
should be labeled with CFUs, but should also have that dose guaranteed to time of expiration. Uh, there are many products that are on shelf that will um, that will describe the uh, the colony forming units at time of manufacture. And because they're live microorganisms, they will die off from the minute they're manufactured um, until they reach your home. So um, those are just some elements to think about if you are choosing a probiotic to help with your microbiome. Um, and again, the last little factoid is, you know, if you think of probiotics like antibiotics or drugs, you know, pick the, pick the right strain for the right benefit and at the right dose. Um, another tool um, to improve your microbiota is making sure that you, your diet includes a lot of prebiotics. So prebiotics are the fuel for those good bacteria that are already in your gut microbiota. Um, and in the upper right corner, you'll see a couple of, of diagrams um, and the reason I have them there is to just point out that different microbes like different foods. So these are basically um, cartoons of some fibers that bacteria like. Um, and, and they're very different in structure and they're different in the sugars that compose them. And this is a very important difference to microbes. So there are some microbes that are only gonna like the blue sugars. And there's some microbes that are only going to like the green ones. And there are some microbes that can chop the, uh, the, the bond between the blue and the green sugar and others that can't, can't make any progress on that at all. So you really need that diverse uh, um, um, consensus, if you will, of these microbes so that you can get all of the benefits from these prebiotics. Um, but again, these benefits from the prebiotics um, are, are predicated on the fact that you've already got good bacteria in your microbiota and you want to feed them more. Um, and then just one last comment about prebiotics is that a lot of folks equate fiber to prebiotics and that's not necessarily the case. Um, not all fibers are prebiotic and not all prebiotics are fibers. So there are other polyphenols and other compounds that you get in, in a healthy diet that are prebiotic and feed those good bacteria that are already in your gut. Um, and then a, another element of confusion sometimes um, has to do with fermented foods. So um, fermented foods are good for your diet. If they're truly fermented foods, they're, they are good for you. Um, but remember that what a fermented food actually is, is a is a food that's been exposed to bacteria or yeast. And, and the goal is to achieve a, a, a particular texture and flavor, right? So for example, yogurt, right? You're, you're trying to achieve a tangy flavor, a texture that's smooth, um, not too watery or, you know, so there's, there's goals in mind for this fermented food. Um, however, um, Typical for, for fermented foods in your home may be very rich in microbes, but fermented foods that you buy from the grocery store may have very few live microbes left. Um, most of those foods have to be pasteurized. Um, and to be honest, some of those microbes, once they've done their job and they've run out of the carbohydrates that they like, they will just die off. So um, there's pretty limited clinical evidence to date um, with respect to a clinical trial demonstrating a benefit with fermented foods. And again, fermented foods are a spectrum. Um, sauerkraut's a fermented food and so is beer. So, you know, there's like a, 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 a huge range of, of, of types of fermented foods. Um, but the other thing I'll point out is that um, the microorganisms in many fermented foods don't survive the stomach, right? The stomach is a very harsh environment. Um, so when it's exposed to the acid and the bile, a lot of times the microbes will die there before they can reach the intestines. Um, the other issue with fermented foods, it's hard to reproduce the benefit. So um, if you make your own yogurt, for example, um, even if you make your own, you will have a varying degree of uh, live microbes left um, each time you make it. Um, so there, there are, um, obviously fermented foods are very good, but there are some caveats um, in, in relying on them. And then this is just another comparator um, 
you know, there are, are fermented foods and beverages like we just talked about in the middle column, but we're also seeing uh, a rise in uh, the number of enriched foods and beverages. So foods and beverages that are typically not fermented that have had added microbes to them. So um, I see on shelf, I see orange juice with added probiotics and I see uh, cookies with probiotics. And these are what we would call enriched foods and beverages. And, and often um, the dose is not efficacious. Uh, it may not even be well described. Um, and again, it, it can be hard to reproduce. Um, and then on the other far right, our supplements, um, these are typically um, one purpose only. They're to deliver probiotics. They typically do a pretty good job if you, if you shop um, wisely um, and can offer some benefits, but they also, they offer limited nutrients, right? They're not going to be um, really taking up, um, filling many gaps in your diet, for example, um, other than live microorganisms. Um, so here's some examples of some labels. And, and this is, I hope, I hope this will be a good take home message in terms of um, what to look for if you're trying to um, improve your microbiota. Um, and if you're using, for example, in this case, sup, uh, dietary supplements um, with probiotics. Um, I just wanted to point out um, with, the, with the yellow boxes, um, you'll see the strain names. I hope you can see the strain names um, labeled. So in, in this upper left corner, Lactobacillus rhamnosus GG. So Lactobacillus is the genus, rhamnosus is the strain, and, or rhamnosus is the species, and GG is the strain. And like I mentioned before, the FDA requires that we label uh, supplements with milligram quantities, which is pretty meaningless for live microbes, but a good product will also um, label with the number of CFUs so that you understand what you're getting and that you can pick the right strain at the right dose for the benefit you desire. Um, in the lower left corner, um, another product that does a great job um, labeling their their strain, they actually are going down to the subspecies level as well as a strain level. So Bifidobacterium longum, subspecies longum strain 35624. Um, now they uh, labeled with milligrams as the FDA requires, but in the, in, the, in the fine print, you'll see that, ooh, sorry. In the fine print, you'll see that they are equating their four milligrams to a billion colony forming units. Um, when manufactured, and then they're saying that um, that we will lose two logs, so that'll be down to one times 10 to the seventh CFUs uh, by the time of expiration. And then on the left is kind of a not so great example um, because the the company here isn't isn't telling us what strains are in in the product. Um, they're they're just relying on the genus and species, which is not helpful. Um, because if you really wanted to know what the clinical benefits are, you really need to have the strain name. Um, the blue box um, shows some, some of what they're calling a prebiotic blend. Um, the doses that are delivered here are typically not prebiotic, uh, effective as a prebiotic. They're very, very small doses. Um, most prebiotics require grams of, of um, material to be prebiotic. Um, and I, I'm not sure what this fiber gum bio registered trademark is that maybe that has a, a selective activity, um, which, which may justify the part of the blend, but, you know, again, just look at the, at the labels, um, should you decide to go the supplement route? Um, you know, again, prebiotics, you typically need grams of material, um, and, and 150 milligrams is unlikely to, to, to be much help. Um, and again, in the red box, um, this company says formulated with 60 billion CFUs at time of manufacturing. And, you know, by the time of expiration, you're probably going to have 600 million CFUs or less, um, depending on the organism and how it's packaged. That's the other thing. Um, the way people keep probiotics alive is through very specialized packaging that excludes moisture and oxygen. Um, as best they can, um, just to give you more days on days of, of viable probiotic activity. Um, 
So I can I can review here a little bit, just talking about you know the microbiome and its its importance for health, optimal health, um, and that's because of all the functions that it contributes to, uh, both digestive and beyond the digestive system. Um, some, some takeaways about probiotics, and if you were to choose those as part of your daily regimen, um, some, some features to look for in a good probiotic. Um, again, you wanna have something that has um, clinical support behind it uh, so that you can rely on the dose. And, and also so that it can, um, they, it's also manufactured properly so that you know that the dose that you want and you bought will be there when you consume it at home. Um, there are ways to make these products stable, and if companies invest properly, then they can deliver them to you in an efficacious dose. <clears throat> and the other thing I would caution about is that um, a lot of these multi-strain, multi-ingredient blends, um, they have yet to be clinically um, proven, clinically studied even. Um, when you mix microbes together, you can actually have them compete, um, and when you mix microbes with prebiotics. Um, an issue there is that the prebiotics often contribute moisture, um, which also limits the viability of the probiotics. So it, it is a lot more complicated from a formulation standpoint than, than one might think. Um, again, with, with respect to prebiotics, not all fibers are prebiotic, and that you can get prebiotics in, in compounds that are not considered fibers. Um, fermented foods, while they're, they're healthy, um, especially if you make them at home and you know how to do it, um, but the ones you buy in the store may or may not be delivering on the live microbes that you're looking for. Um, and that same holds true with uh, other foods and beverages. Um, and then the last point is this concept of symbiotic. Um, so there are now two ways of describing a symbiotic. Um, uh, I would say five years ago, there was a kind of a, a set definition of symbiotic and that required that the probiotic and the prebiotic work together um, to deliver a benefit. That is that the probiotic actually use the prebiotic as fuel. But um, there are a few authoritative organizations that have since released uh, new definitions, um, one of which uh, counts, <laughs> if you will, um, for any combination of a probiotic, effective probiotic and effective prebiotic. So you may be seeing symbiotics as a term um, if you are shopping for, um, for, for tools to, to improve your gut microbes. Um, any other, any questions? Hi, Margaret, we have lots of questions for you. Okay, good. All right, so let's go back to the beginning. All right, so the first question we had, um, it came in a little bit ago. How do you recover a gut biome after medical treatments or can you recover it? So, you know, there is a lot of work being done about this particular topic um, for cancer treatments, for people who've taken big doses of antibiotics, um, folks who've been hospitalized and been subjected not only to antibiotics, but to special diets. So special diets can be limiting too, because um, like, for example, an IBS patient, may be avoiding um, fermentable oligosaccharides, um, the, what they call a low FODMAP diet. And they may be avoiding them because it triggers their symptoms. But what they're also avoiding are the, are the beneficial features of these oligosaccharides, these, these uh, prebiotics. So um, you can actually um, erode your microbiome, both from a drug or a diet standpoint or through medications and recovering them there, there are um, probiotics and prebiotics that have been shown to restore uh, the microbiome. Now, it may not re they, they may not restore it to baseline, but there have, they definitely show improvement. Um, there's also a lot of discussion on fecal microbial transplant. Um, so it, it's very controversial. Um, it has not been uh, very well studied. And when you think about characterizing the, um, the sample, if you will, the fecal microbial sample, um, that is still a bit of an unknown, right? I mean, a year and a half ago, those samples wouldn't have been tested for COVID-19. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot of work being done to um, produce 
uh, drugs, really, these are going to be drugs that will restore a microbiome. Um, some of them are, are genetically designed, uh, so they are looking at microbes that deliver benefits, and they're genetically modifying them to make sure that there's nothing else that they can do to you, um, and then mixing them together in studied quantities and studied ratios. And again, there's the fecal microbial transplant, which, um, uh, you know, there's, there's a, a more, you know, what we're thinking of as poop pills, but there are also far more designed um, uh, products, if you will, uh, that will, that will deliver things in a, in a more controlled way, if, you know, for lack of a better term. Um, so, you know, all is not lost. If, if you feel like you have uh, wiped out your gut uh, microbes, um, there are ways to at least begin to restore that. Um, I don't want to overpromise, but the, that's certainly something that is, is, is gaining a lot of interest or has a lot of interest and a lot of investment. And I think we'll be seeing them as drugs um, in not too far in the future. Thank you for that. Our next question is, why do pets affect the microbiome? Can you say that again? Why, why do pets affect the microbiome? Because they bring, um, they bring more diversity to you. Um, so you, they're going, you know, even if they're not going outside, they have different microbes that they harbor as their beneficial microbes. And it's just, there was a study, um, I want to say 10 years ago, where they looked at uh, city dwelling folks and folks that live on a farm. In fact, they were uh, studying folks that live on farms and it was a particular community in Europe where they lived above the livestock. Literally, they, the barn was, you know, the livestock lived below and the, and the people lived in housing above it. And they were looking at their microbiota and their incidence of allergy and their incidence of, of gut disease and all this other stuff and just really seeing that um, this lifestyle really in and of itself helped to preserve a very healthy microbiome. Um, they also, um, there's also been lots of studies um, in different geography, if you will. So there's, there was a study, and I can't remember the, the country, but it was a very, very, very remote community in South America. And looking at that community almost as the, the ancient or the, uh, uh, I guess it would be ancient, the ancient microbiome before McDonald's and antibiotics and Purell got a hold of it. <laughs> so it, I think the, the more different microbes you're exposed to and, and different, uh, different foods you're exposed to. You know, you hear, um, you know, eat the rainbow. And um, that, that's because you're going to be, all those different um, nutrients that you're ingesting are feeding different bugs in your gut. And so, you know, the, the more diversity, the better. I hope that, I hope that answered the question. <laughs> Okay, so the next couple you had touched upon, but I'm still going to ask so that in case you have anything to add, we can cover that. After taking antibiotics, how to how do you rebuild the microbiota again? And then the next piece was how long after taking an antibiotic does the antibiotic affect your body in a bad way? So it depends. Um, so the first question was how do you rebuild? And you know, again, you know. Resuming a healthy diet, um, looking to proven probiotics can help, looking for prebiotics that also can help. Um, you know, again, the healthy diet is a big element of that prebiotic uh, menu. Um, you know, I, I think those are, those are the things I can think of off the top of my head. Um, I think that's, that's a, it depends on the antibiotic too. Um, some antibiotics are much more aggressive than others, and some actually act directly in the gut. So many antibiotics have to go through like a first pass, if you will. So your liver is involved in processing the drug into its active form. Um, but some antibiotics go directly to the gut. And so they can be some of the most aggressive and the hardest to come back from. Um, there are definitely antibiotics associated with incidence of C. difficile, um, which I mentioned was kind of a, a, a very serious side effect of some antibiotics. So again, it, it, it depends on the antibiotic, but um, and it'll depend on that antibiotic if you even see uh, an adverse event. Um, some, people, some people take antibiotics and have, 
have never had an adverse event from it. Um, other people can can barely keep them down when they take them, and often, you know, often just are not even offered that drug. You know, I know a few people who can't even keep Bactrim down. You know, they so they the doctor doesn't even offer it to them. Um, so it, you know, it depends on the drug. It depends on you. Everyone's microbiome is different. The healthier your microbiome is going into antibiotic treatment, the healthier it will be coming out. Um, and how long how long it takes to feel that dysbiosis varies again with you and the drug, and how long it takes to recover from that dysbiosis again will vary. But there are a few tools you can use. Um, you know, again, if you look for clinically supported products, um, you know, you can if you can use PubMed or you can basically go to company websites and look for clinical support for their products. They often will be very proud. If they have clinical support for their product, they're gonna be very proud about it and they're gonna be wanting to tell you about it. So it, it's, it's often not that hard to find. Does that answer the question? Um, I will wait to see I if they <laughs> check back in and chat on that, but thank you for that. Um, we're moving now into prebiotics. Are they more important than probiotics? I don't know that they're more important, but I think they're easier to acquire from your diet. Um, I think if you eat a varied diet, um, you know, if you, if you look at prebiotics on the shelf, one of the most common prebiotics on shelf is inulin. And sometimes they call it inulin, sometimes they call it chicory root or chicory root extract or chicory root concentrate, but it's inulin. <clears throat> and, and the best source of inulin is like onions. Onions, onions have a great amount of inulin. <laughs> Um, now that can be why some people onions don't agree with them. <laughs> so, so that's the other element, right? You, you're going to try to um, feed your gut things that you can that you can feel comfortable with. Um, if if uh, so, diet a you know, healthy diet, a diverse diet is super important. Lots of plants, um, but you can also buy prebiotics and probiotics. Um, but again, you know, looking for some that are high quality, delivering a clinically studied. Um, either microbe or fiber or prebiotic, um, and that have been, you know, packaged properly so that your the dose that you're buying is guaranteed to the time you consume it. That's another element that I think people forget about with live microbes. Thank you for that. Um, are taking supplements good enough or does it have to come from food? Well, it depends what you can tolerate, right? If you know that you're, if you know that you're not, um, you're not, you're not going to be eating fermented foods. Um, you, you question whether your diet is adequate. Um, try a try a supplement. Um, just look for one that's, just look for one that that's of high quality. Um, I I really think there's a lot of stuff out there that is not of high quality. Um, you want to look for a brand that has, you know, I tell my family skin in the game, right? You don't want these fly-by-night guys that, you, that pop up on Amazon. Um, you want to look for somebody who you can trust um, because, you know, it's not that big a deal if you, if, if you, if the probiotic, you're not happy with it, but, you know, don't discount the entire category because one probiotic didn't work for you. Um, you want to, you want to find one that delivers the benefit you seek, has clinical support, but then also works with your microbiota to deliver that benefit. Um, most of these strains have been studied in a variety of people and have delivered that benefit in a clinically significant way, but everyone's microbiota is different. And, you know, for example, if you just came off of antibiotics, you may be in a very different position than, uh, than you were, you know, months before then. Okay, so the next question you did partially answer. You just gave us the example of the onion, but what are some other examples of prebiotics? Oh, let's see. Um, so, so in addition to fibers, like when you think about multigrain foods, if they're truly multigrain, these are these are prebiotic. Um, um, inulin. Um, you also see, not necessarily in foods, but in supplements, you'll see. Um, a number of different oligosaccharides, uh, galacto-oligosaccharides or GOS, G-O-S, fructo-oligosaccharide or FOS, F-O-S. Um, FOS is actually the, the building blocks of inulin. Um, 
and also xylo oligosaccharides. So there's lots of different sugars that um, are, you know, constructed in these long chains, and they're effectively oligosaccharides. And the the branching of the different sugars and the type of sugar they're made out of um, feed different good microbes. So, um, you know, inulin and onions is one I always hear about. Someone always talks about Jerusalem artichokes as a being a good source. I don't know a lot of people that eat a lot of Jerusalem artichokes. So I'm, I'm usually, that's not the first thing that comes to mind, but I think, you know, whole grains, um, you know, there's also some resistant starches that are known to have prebiotic activity. Um, I've, I've seen articles around um, not potato, not potato, um, cooked potato, but cooked and cooled potato. Um, the starch changes its shape when it cools, so it becomes more resistant. Um, so there, it, it offers another type of um, benefit to the microbes. Um, I think, you know, just, I just think of plants all the time when I think of prebiotics. So, you know, the more different kinds of plants and fruits that you can, you know, vegetables and fruits that you can incorporate into your diet um, will, will offer not only prebiotics, but a diverse um, complement of prebiotics. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, next question is, what species of probiotics should you look for in a supplement? So depends on what you want to do. What, you know, what's, what, is your, what, is, what are you looking for as a benefit? Um, and again, you're not just looking for species, you're looking for strain name. So it's, it's genus, species, strain. So three names you wanna look for. Um, there are, from a genus standpoint, there are a lot of lactobacilli that have been very well studied um, and deliver benefits like uh, reduced gas and bloating. Um, there are, there are there's a bifidobacterium that's been studied for IBS symptoms that, that's been shown to relieve, um, again, bloating um, and pain due to IBS. Um, if you want something to counter your antibiotic, uh, in other words, you, you're prescribed an antibiotic and you want to prevent or at least minimize the disruption to your microbiota, um, two, two strains that come to mind are lactobacillus rhamnosus GG and Saccharomyces boulardii, which is a yeast. Um, so in the yeast case, you just have two names, just adding to the confusion there. So um, depending on the benefit that you want, you can find, uh, you can usually try to find the strain that, uh, or, or combination of strains that have clinical support for that benefit. Um, there's a number of products in the market for vaginal health that have great clinical support as well. Um, and then there's even some for oral health. So if, um, if you, you know, I know some people, you know, you know, if you know, if you're someone who has oral health issues, right. And sometimes a probiotic can help with that as well. And there are strains that have clinical support for that. Okay. We have a few more questions on the probiotics. They were a popular topic. Uh, is the probiotic still as effective if you open the capsule and mix it with food or beverage? For the most part, if you consume it right away, yes. If you open the capsule and leave it hanging around, or if you mix it into your beverage and leave that hanging around, then you're going to be losing, you're going to be losing some viability. Also, don't mix it into something super hot. Um, so stay away from your tea. Uh, <clears throat> so another complicating element to probiotics is there is a genus of probiotics that can withstand all kinds of heat and moisture, <clears throat> and that is bacilli. So when you see a, a probiotic that's provided in a gummy form, um, they always use bacilli for this. Um, so bacilli are spore formers. So what they can do when, when the conditions are inhospitable, um, whether it's too little moisture or too much heat, um, they, they they produce an armor around themselves and they kind of go dormant until the environment improves. And when the environment improves then they more or less resume their, um, their living processes. Um, so bacilli can survive baking and boiling and, you know, and gummy form, gummy manufacturing, which involves, you know, boiling or heat. Um, but um, bacilli are not as well studied as lactobacilli and bifidobacterium. There are a number of bacilli that are well studied. Um, one of them that comes to mind is uh, BC30. 
Um, another one is called lactospore, and a third one I know of is DE111. So these are three that do have clinical support. Um, and again, those are three that can withstand whatever you're going to dish out, more or less. Um, that one, you, if it was in a capsule, for example, um, you could you could put it in hot tea and consume it, and it would be just as efficacious as if you ate the capsule. Great, thank you. <clears throat> can you take one probiotic in the morning and a different one in the evening? Would they each be effective? Yeah, it depends what you're looking for. Um, if, if, if you're looking at a clinically supported product and you're taking it in the morning and likewise in the evening, then there's a very good chance that they would be effective. Um, because the studies weren't done that way, I can't promise you, um, but because you're, you're adding several billion CFUs to trillions of CFUs in your gut, um, they're probably, they probably wouldn't run into each other, um, you know, if they were run into each other, you know, in, in, in virtual space, um, given how many other bugs are there. Um, but again, I can't promise because the, that's typically not how the studies are run. Um, they're usually focusing on a regimen that is provided all at once, whether it's once a day or twice a day, but provided all at once. So next we have a pretty interesting question. Does following a FODMAP diet create issues or imbalance for the bio microbiome? So if you're talking about low FODMAP, yeah, we, we do think that it can. Um, now there's a low FODMAP is often very effective for many people who suffer from IBS. But what that's also doing is it's very limiting to the, the prebiotics that are in your diet, right? You're, you're not you're not eating onions, you're not eating, um, sometimes folks stay away from carbohydrate, many carbohydrates altogether. Um, and so, you know, folks who have celiac disease also run the risk of this because they're, the, the carbohydrates that they're consuming um, are really different from your typical, uh, well, typical Western diet for sure, but typical um, prebiotic compounds that you would normally take. So, you know, um, the jury's still out, but if you think about it logically, it makes sense that if you are um, restricting um, the fibers or the prebiotics that you're feeding your microbes, then, then it, it can affect your, your gut microbes going forward. Um, and they do think that IBS sufferers, um, there's a contributing element from the microbiome. So folks who have IBS, um, when you study their fecal microbiota, um, they look very, very different from um, people without IBS. Um, the, the, comp the composition of microbes is quite different. Um, now you could say, is that chicken or is that egg, right? Did it start that way? And the FODMAPs didn't affect it at all or the lack of FODMAPs or did the low FODMAP diet um, exacerbate the problem? It's, it's hard to know, but um, there are a lot of clinical trials right now running on IBS. Um, so I think um, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to learn more. We're going to learn more. Great. Thank you. So we're almost heading up to our time. Do you have time for just a couple more questions? Sure. Okay. So we have one more. Do prebiotics feed the back bacteria as well as the good bacteria? So the definition of prebiotic is that they feed the good bacteria. Um, and the way prebiotics are, are studied is, is requiring requiring that. Not only by definition is a prebiotic feeding the good bacteria, but by definition a prebiotic should deliver a health benefit. Um, now sometimes that may only be um, an abundance of good bacteria, but um, you know basically a studied something something that's claiming to be prebiotic and has been studied and proven to be a prebiotic will be feeding good bacteria only um, and delivering that benefit. Um, I understand the question though, because um, it stands to reason, but by definition, when we think about prebiotics, um, they should really only be feeding the good bacteria. Great, so these are somewhat related. Do you drink, if you drink lots of liquids, can that make the probiotic or prebiotic less effective? And if you follow a gluten-free diet, are they also less effective, prebiotic and or the probiotic? Um, I doubt that drinking a lot of liquid would, I mean, I don't know the answer to that for real, but, um, I can't imagine how 
extra hydration would hurt the probiotic or the prebiotic. Um, if anything, if, you're, if you are really increasing your consumption of prebiotics, you probably want to increase your hydration as well. <clears throat> if, um, and then the second question, I already forgot what it was, sorry. No problem. If you follow a gluten-free diet, does that make the prebiotic or the probiotic less effective? So we don't, we don't know the answer to that. Um, and it probably will, it probably will depend on the probiotic or the prebiotic. Um, but also as gluten-free diets go, um, you are, you are, you are consuming a kind of a different profile of carbohydrates than a non-gluten-free diet. So you may have a, a different composition of microbes in your gut. You know, my daughter has celiac disease and, um, it's something be between, it's between the vitamin enriched product and the um, the prebiotic complement, I do worry a little bit about that. But I, I, I don't have evidence to show you on that. It's just something that I think logically um, raises questions. And then our last two questions before we go and enjoy this day. Should, mm -hmm. we, should we take prebiotics before or after meals? Um, it, for prebiotics, it really doesn't matter. Um, probiotics, some people think, and this is a different, I always look at how the regimen was designed for the clinical trial when I'm thinking about this, but um, some people think if you take them before on an empty stomach, that the acid in your stomach will be more aggressive. And then I've also heard the same thing about after. Um, so I, you know, I think if you decide to use a probiotic, um, you should take it at the time of day that you're most likely to be consistent with it. That's, that's typically what I tell my family. Um, and as far as prebiotic goes, I mean, it, that's just, it's like, it's like eating a, like a magic food pill, right? So uh, whatever you would do uh, with eating food is, is okay to take a prebiotic. It's, it's just another form of um, like, you know, concentrated food, if you will, concentrated uh, onions. <laughs> Thank you for that. And then our very last one, if a probiotic capsule has too many CFUs, is it effective fresh if you use half or third per day? Well, it's hard to know what you mean by too many. Um, I would try to buy a product that delivers the CFUs you want in a single dose. Um, because if you do open the capsule, I think the viability is really gonna suffer. Um, so like taking half a dose, I just don't think it's gonna work so well. Um, if it's like, even if it's like a chewable tablet or a gummy, like a gummy, a gummy you could do that with. I don't know that gummies have many CFUs in them though. Typically they're along the 2 billion, you know, give or take, um, range, um, capsules. Um, again, if you open the capsule, I think you're going to, the viability is definitely going to decline. Um, they also make chewable tablets, um, that might, if you cut that in half, again, I, you know, it, it's hard for me to know without knowing which product you're looking at. I would try harder to find one at the dose you really want. All right, great. So I did add your resources into the chat that you had great. on that, that last slide um, that we didn't get to, but it is in the chat. So we, everyone is able to click on those links. And I do wanna thank you again for spending this hour with us. It's been super informational and um, the audience members have thoroughly enjoyed it. Great, great. I'm really glad that people could, could join us. It's great. Thanks for the opportunity.